And we are live. Hello, this is Darlene with ReviewPhotography.com, and today I am talking with Don Komarichka. Don is a nature and wildlife photographer. He lives in Barrie, Ontario, and he teaches macro photography, among other things. He specializes in unique and stunning photographs of snowflakes, of all things. So today he's going to give us some tips and tricks on macro photography, and we're going to ask him about some some of his other adventures that he's been on lately as well. So welcome, Don. Thank you very much for having me. So I'd like to start off by, um, we chatted a little bit before we started. I know you're fairly new to photography um, compared to my 25-some years. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're about, what, five years into photography? About five years ago, uh, maybe five and a half by now, I, I purchased my first camera. And prior to that, I had absolutely no inkling to uh, to take pictures. So it, it's, a, it's a new experience for me. And I mix that with... I mean, I used to be very science-minded. I still am quite science-minded, and, and that's one of the things that, uh, I guess, affects my photography in many interesting ways because I can take that and, and use photography to, to you know, pursue that interest as well, and the results are often fascinating. I can definitely see that cross with the snowflakes. It's almost mm -hmm. like they're under a microscope. It, well, in, in many ways, they are. In fact, uh, more detail than a microscope could actually give. Yeah, I think they're they're stunning. Well, we're going to get into seeing some of those, but uh, I'd, I'd like to know since uh, since you mentioned that you never had an interest in photography, what got you started? Like, was there a particular image that you saw, and and why macro? Why snowflakes? Uh, well, I'll I'll start from the beginning. Uh, my father used to be uh, quite into photography, and w when he was younger, like he was the uh, uh, the photography nerd in the dark room in elementary school or in high school rather, uh, putting together the yearbook, and and that was his real passion. And he wanted to pursue pursue a career in photography, uh, but my grandparents, his parents, uh, said no. Uh, you know, there's no way to make money at that. You can't get a stable income. You can't, uh, you know, support a family on that kind of stuff. And so he went into uh, electrical uh, technician programs, and and he had a great career. He loved his career, but he always loved photography and never got to pursue it. Uh, my dad passed away about four years ago now, and uh, when he was getting ill, he uh, gave me an envelope that had about a thousand dollars in it and said just go buy something that you want to enjoy that you want to uh, you know just make make you happy and so I went out without really knowing why I just went out and bought a camera because I I had an idea that I wanted to connect with him and uh, my parents had divorced and all that and this is getting a little personal but I love to tell the story um, so he taught me everything that he knew about photography and uh, which was a fair bit and uh, when he had passed on, then I took that little spark that he gave me and uh, started to pursue it as an amateur photographer and exploring new interesting ways to take pictures. And um, about three years ago, I just dove in and, uh, and went pro and it started depending on my income uh, solely from photography and my related adventures. And, you know, it, and that includes uh, everything from working in a camera store to teaching and, uh, you know, doing printing services and, heck, even cleaning camera sensors and everything that I could do around photography uh, to make a few dollars here and there. And it's all added up and it continues to add up to a wonderful career. Cool. Now, I know um, you also write for, okay, I want to get this right, Outdoor Photography Canada magazine, correct? Yes, absolutely. I've been with them for a little bit over a year now. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that the upcoming issue, which uh, some subscribers may have already gotten, but it's on the newsstands early January, has one of my photos on the cover. And uh, it's the second cover shot that I've gotten, so I'm thrilled about that. And uh, it's funny because both photographs happen to be macro photographs. And not too many magazines uh, publish macro photos on their covers, so I'm quite happy to, uh, to be filling in that spot. Oh, interesting. I wonder why that is. I don't know. I mean, a lot of photography magazines uh, want a really nice eye-catching shot on the cover, and I don't know why, because uh, macro photographs are often very eye-catching and inspiring and, and fascinating, if nothing else. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't know if, if you've seen it, uh, Darlene, but I, I'm going to pull it up right here and just show you this, uh, this one particular image that uh, I was really quite happy with the way that it turned out, and it was just an idea that I had that, uh, you know, upon execution turned out to be something really, really quite awesome. So uh, let me just do a, a quick screen share of this particular image. And uh, this shot 
Oh, I did see this one, yeah. Is a uh, water droplet on a flower petal with the earth inside of the droplet. And that was a fun little thing to create because uh, all it is is a printed map of the earth courtesy of NASA in behind that's flipped upside down uh, because when things are refracted, they'll flip, flip around, so you want it upside right. And uh, this is actually photographed with a Pringles can as a light modifier. Uh, nice. So I was just experimenting, and yeah, I've got off-camera flash cords and ring flashes and all of the, the tools, but trying to do it as low-tech as possible, uh, I was able to, to get away with the Pringles can, and that worked pretty well. Well, interesting that you should mention that when things are refracted, they end up upside down and inverted, since you have a little device behind you over your shoulder there called a 4x5 camera. That's right. And I did some I did some trolling of your website and your Google <laughs> Plus, and I found out that you once upon a time took a four by five on a photo walk. Tell this was in the that. summer, uh, and that was a fun experiment. You know, I I thought I've been downtown Toronto many times. I've been on photo walks in that area before, uh, so. Yeah, I can bring a camera and I can take pictures, but I'm there more to communicate and you know make new friends, meet other people in the photographic community, and take a few photographs while I'm at it. So why not start up a bunch of conversations by bringing my 4x5 camera with me? And I think I took six photographs that day, and my shoulder was quite sore at the end of it, uh, walking all around downtown Toronto with a gigantic camera like that. And that's a, an Arca Swiss 4x5. And uh, it's funny because the very first time that I had looked at a, uh, a 4x5 camera, I was just shocked to see the world upside down in the back uh, on the, um, uh, I guess, the, the laser etched uh, focusing screen on there. And I just, I was fascinated by that. And, and I kind of, I've always, liked, like I had mentioned, like to see the way the world works and to understand exactly how that's happening and why and you know how your eyes even uh, flip things upside down and your brain flips it back the right way and it's just understanding how you see the world is a wonderful thing that photography lets you do. Very cool, very cool. Um, yeah, it's interesting because my background is um, that I started with a 4x5 and have progressively gone smaller so it's interesting to me that you, you started in digital, correct? I did, I did. I, I had a Canon Digital Rebel as my, my first camera and I've experimented with film. I own a, a few film cameras but the 4x5 is interesting because it's still valuable to shoot with one of those today. If you do everything right, so you've got your proper exposure, everything's in focus, uh, you're using a really good quality film you can get around 300 megapixels if it's scanned properly from one frame of 4x5 and there's nothing in the digital realm uh, that can match that and so it, it's fun to just take that out and make a scan of it or uh, play around with contact prints and just explore different areas of photography that I haven't explored before. I find that uh, when I'm playing around with macro stuff or stuff that I'm familiar with it's fun to experiment, and I do learn a little bit more. But if I take myself right out of the element of, uh, of, of out of my comfort zone, and I play around with four by five and doing you know alternative printing methods and all sorts of fun stuff, I learn much more in that day of experimenting than I could have doing anything else. Absolutely. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely, and the whole, um, you know, I only took, what was it, six photos that day, that's something that I try and tell to my students, and it's actually something that I wrote in, in the ebook that I give away on my website, um, that if you go in, out and um, purposely limit yourself, whether it be choosing one lens only, like a 50 prime versus a zoom, or, okay, I'm only going to shoot vertical today, or or taking a 4x5 and I'm only going to shoot six pictures today total, you become a lot more conscious of what you're shooting and absolutely more selective. Right? As soon as you put limitations on yourself, creativity abounds within those limitations. And it's the same thing um, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm walking around with my 65 millimeter macro lens on, which is the, uh, the lens that I use for most of my macro work, I'm inherently limiting myself to just tiny subjects. And I have to start looking and crawling around on the ground of the forest to find something interesting. And you know what? That's going to mean, yes, I am going to miss the birds that are above me. I'm going to miss any wildlife that happens to be around. If I'm coming across a waterfall, well, maybe I can capture a water droplet, but I'm not going to get the big <laughs> the picture. Whole, yeah. And just going and telling yourself that, yes, I am going to miss opportunities and feeling very comfortable with that. I think that's an important thing uh, because you're limiting yourself and you're going to take pictures because of those limitations that otherwise you'd have no capability to. So, yeah. Absolutely. 
So um, we talked about the snowflake thing. Can you tell us a little bit about your process that you go through? Because um, I personally have never done the technique that you use, which is called focus stacking. And I'm sure that a lot of people will be interested to see sort of the process that you use to do that. Of course. Well, first of all, I'll tell you how I got into photographing snowflakes. And uh, I bought the wonderful lens that Canon offers. No, I, as far as I know, no other manufacturer offers such a lens. It's the MPE 65 millimeter lens. And I have the camera right here. And this particular lens is a very specialized macro lens. It starts at one to one life size. And then as I spin the, um, uh, the lens here, it goes all the way up to five to one life size. And that allows me to get five times closer than the average macro lens can. And that's a big difference because now I can get so much closer to things like snowflakes. Um, I was working at a desk job at the time that I bought that lens. And I brought it into work and I'm just farting around on my lunch break, photographing anything on my desk, like push pins and cork board and staples and just anything, ballpoint pens that, that were interesting around me. Cool. And um, I looked outside and it happened to be snowing. So I thought, you know what, let's see what, what I can do. So um, this was shortly after Christmas, and uh, I had, uh, I, my, my grandmother had knit me some, uh, some homemade mittens. And of course, I brought them. I wanted to put them to good use, so I had one of those sitting next to me, and I have it right here. This is what's used to photograph every single one of my snowflake photographs. Uh, they're all photographed as they have fallen onto that mitten. And so far, I haven't found a better surface to photograph them. Uh, it's a nice dark uh, background, so it, it adds the contrast that I need. But it also helps isolate the snowflake from a busy background and helps insulate them against the, uh, the temperature of whatever surface they're on because they're only hitting a fiber or two and not flat against a surface, so they don't melt. And uh, that's how it got started. But there's an inherent problem with uh, snowflake photography, and that is that uh, you can't get a whole lot in focus at those levels of magnification. So I'm going to bring up a little example here of a snowflake photograph that is, um, it's not what you might expect if you've seen some of my images. I'll, I'm going to show you exactly how they look when they come out of the camera. Okay. And this is... Uh, just a complete unprocessed shot from my camera. Now, tell me what you're looking at here. Uh, I see the top part of the snowflake looks like it's in focus and the bottom is not. That's right, and there's all sorts of junk around it. If I were to, to zoom in on that as well, you can see that the focus is quite razor thin. And in uh, on these settings, it's probably less than a millimeter or so. And you can see that there's little bits of, um, you know, the, the mitten and the little fibers of the wool that come in in the background. And all of that has to be edited out and, and fixed up. And, uh, and of course, you know, your basic uh, photo editing skills of, you know, brightening and sharpening and adjusting your saturation, all, all that at the finished product. But when I'm done with this, uh, it turns into this. And this is that same snowflake after I finished uh, mucking around with it in Photoshop and playing around with, um, uh, with all the different layers. So how do I get from point A to point B? But more importantly, why do I need to get from point A to point B? And that has to deal with how light bends and, and how it doesn't. Uh, when you get closer and closer to a photographic subject, you notice that even if at, at the exact same aperture, the exact same settings in the camera, uh, you have less and less and less in focus. And as you get closer and closer to something like a snowflake, your depth of field, even if you're shooting at, say, f22, is going to be very, very thin. And uh, with this particular lens, it actually has a conversion chart in the, uh, in the manual. Because if I set this to f16, it's not actually f16 unless I'm at 1 to 1. If I dial it into 5 to 1, that's f96. Wow. And F96, uh, if you shot uh, 4x5, you'll know that that doesn't let a whole lot of light in. Uh, and even on a camera like that, you're, you're going to encounter some problems because it makes everything a little bit soft. And uh, you hit diffraction limiting. And without getting into the whole physics of how that works, it just means that the most in-focus areas of your photograph are less sharp than if you were shooting at, say, F16. And uh, even uh, you know f uh, 2.8 or something, you you have the best sharpness in your image um, at the wider apertures. So 
even if I could shoot at f96, I'm A, not going to have it all in focus, and B, even the areas in focus are going to be blurry. So when I first bought this lens, I was walking around just photographing anything I could find, tree bark or mushrooms or anything out in a little hike, and I thought I had a bad copy of the lens because I was doing exactly this. I, I set the camera to f16, dialed in the magnification, I had a ring flash on the front so it gave me as much light as I needed, but everything was blurry. You know, it, as soon as I zoomed in, there was no sharpness, and I was almost going to send it back until I smartened up and did some research and figured out that no, light doesn't bend that way. So, if light doesn't bend that way, how do you get it all in focus? And the real trick is to combine multiple photographs together, each at different focus points. So, for each of these snowflakes that I have, and I'll show you another one here, so it's just not me being a talking head. I'll show you some fun, uh, some fun photographs. Um, I'm just curious, Don, um, for people that might be interested in such a thing, what kind of price tag does that lens carry? Uh, you could probably get it between twelve and fifteen hundred or so, uh, but it's quite unusable without a, a flash of some kind. So whether it's off-camera flash or a ring flash, you'd need that to uh, to complete the uh, the ensemble. Okay, so I thought you were going to say like ten thousand dollars or something. Oh no no no! Uh, but it's like buying a piano. You're not going to play like Mozart because you have a piano that he played on. Um, it requires a lot of skill and attention to those specific details. Getting things in focus with a lens such as this is quite tricky, and uh, in order to get good results and and keep getting good results, you really have to you know go through the levels of frustration that. Uh, uh, that you don't want to because you're just going to get disappointed with photographs after photographs and you might spend an entire day taking pictures and not really be happy with anything um, but you'll learn in the process and you you learn from your mistakes so are you speaking from experience when you say those oh things? am I ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, well, like when you see a lot of these images these photographs are taken after many many attempts at focus stacking and at figuring out exactly how this whole process works and I'll show you another example here if I may um, I, I don't just use this technique for snowflakes, I also use this technique for much of my macro work, including water droplets and refractions and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. So, what about things like insects, because they, they are not going to sit still long enough for you to do multiple pictures, or will You're jumping they? ahead of me, uh, but <laughs> yes, that's true, so you can't typically photograph insects using focus stacking, but there are some techniques in order to do that, especially if the insect isn't exactly alive. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say maybe a little dry ice or some uh, some hot glue or something. Well, you know what, you can do that, and oftentimes you might find, say, a bee that's uh, you know past its final day and it's maybe outside lying on something, and you can pick it up and put it on a flower as if it's still alive, and and maybe make something look lifelike and be able to focus stack it and get something that works as a photograph. Well, there are the photographic purists that will say that's cheating. How do you feel about that? Well. Uh, is a photograph art? I think so. Then you're not cheating any more than a painter or a writer is. Um, I would say that if you make the concession that a photograph is art and it has no perceived documentary value, then you can do whatever you want. Such as a but, newspaper photograph. What's that, sorry? Such as like a newsworthy event where you don't right. want or to... If you're trying to photograph the behavior of a certain animal and you've somehow coerced or tricked an animal into doing something, then I don't believe that, that's, uh, that that should be allowed. But if it's a photograph for art's purpose and art's purpose only and everybody looking at it has no misconceptions of that, then you're free to play around and do whatever you want. And I don't think anybody's going to have misconceptions about a photograph of a bee on a flower being of documentary value. It's just a cool picture. Right. So do whatever you want with that. I'm, yeah. I'm in full agreement on that. Now, but if I, you make the concession that the photograph is not art, then you better be taking insurance photographs uh, or doing photojournalism, uh, in doing anything that is newsworthy like you mentioned. And, and there, I think that if you are a professional photographer today, chances are pretty good you're making art of some kind. Uh, and, and to that end, I just want to show you one example of, uh, of a photograph that I've played with rather extensively. And um, sometimes I do this, but more often I do not. Uh, this is a uh, panorama that has not really been played with too much. Uh, there's a story about how I got into this place being chased by cows and dodging electric fences. Um, but this photograph itself was as best as I could have gotten it in camera. That wasn't good enough for me though because I went ahead and I modified it 
and uh, with different elements replacing certain parts of the image and cleaning it up and doing some pretty drastic adjustments. It's as much art as it was a minute ago and I don't believe it has documentary value. So I think that this photograph is perfectly suited to messing around and playing with and compositing stuff together. Very cool. And in some ways too, uh, mm -hmm. I like to say that my snowflakes, I, I can even add some of that scientific value by doing my focus stacking techniques and combining things together because I have more in focus and I have more to see and there's more to analyze and look at. So it can go both ways. It's never a solid line. It's always a gray line. Um, it's easy to tell what the extremes are, but it's hard when you get right along the, the line to figure out what's good, what's bad. But I, I'm pretty liberal about that. So now what if somebody wants to get into macro photography and they don't want to necessarily invest say twelve to fifteen hundred dollars on a specialized lens and a flash and all that stuff. Is there a simple way to get into macro without a huge investment? Absolutely. Take your lens and put it on backwards. That's step one. How do you uh, do that? I've, I've so, <laughs> experimented with that, but I've never come up with anything that's actually in focus. <laughs> well, see, that's the hardest part, too. Uh, you're a Canon shooter, right, Darlene? Yeah. And so when you dismount a Canon lens, it automatically latches the apertures all the way open. And, and that means that if you take that and reverse mount it, then your aperture is wide open. Your depth of field is almost nothing, especially at that magnification level. So, uh, what you have to do is you have to get very close and you have razor thin focus, but it's a good way to experiment without spending any money at all. Just be careful not to get any dust or fingerprints on the rear element of your lens because that can be hard to clean. Um, but a kit lens, a 50 millimeter lens, anything like that, if you just take it off the camera, flip it around and hold it on, you can buy a $4 adapter on eBay too if you want to make some commitment to cash. Um, and that would let you look through the lens, you'd have to get very close maybe it went that far away from your subject and that will allow you to see the world of macro photography with pretty much no investment. Um, there's other ways to do it as well. Um, you can buy close-up filters for your camera and I don't recommend buying the name brand ones. Uh, I think like Canon and Nikon sell them for like 150 or 200 bucks depending on how big your lens is and they're almost no better than the cheap $20 kit for four filters you can buy on eBay. Uh, because regardless, they're going to degrade the image quality. It's just the nature of how that you know bubbly lens looks. Mm -hmm. You may have seen them, you may not have, but you can even walk into any pharmacy and buy some reading glasses and stick those in front of your camera because it's the exact same optical principle. Reading glasses for your camera is what a close-up filter is. And uh, that just allows the camera to focus closer than it normally would before. It more often than not screws up autofocus, so you know you're going manual on that. But uh, it's another cheap way for 20 bucks on eBay to get close and play around with macro photography. What about extension tubes? I, I was just about to mention that. The next step up from that is going to be extension tubes. So something like these guys here. This is a set of extension tubes from Kenko. And it's just a, it's completely hollow. There's no, um, there's no lenses or, or, or glass involved in this. And it breaks off into three different uh, uh, sections. Now the value in that is you can take this with any lens that you already have and allow the lens to focus closer than you would otherwise be able to. And we were mentioning 4x5 cameras earlier and the same principle is true with bellows on a camera of that design. The further you stretch out the bellows, uh, the closer your focusing distance becomes. And every lens uh, for digital modern cameras has a certain range where the lens elements inside will move back and forth and that will allow you to focus to infinity and the closest of whatever that lens is designed to focus to. And what extension tubes do, and you might use one or two or all three or combinations of, is you take that focusing range and you shift it closer. So now you can no longer focus to infinity, but you can focus closer than the lens would normally be able to focus before. So it takes, uh, if you have a regular lens, extension tubes turn it into a macro lens, but only a macro lens. And if you buy a dedicated macro lens, then that lens can still focus to infinity. And I know a lot of wedding photographers may use those as a long range portrait lens and then a second later do a close up of the rings. It can be versatile. Extension tubes are less versatile, but they're very happy to, ha uh, happy to have on hand. Uh, they're very helpful to have on hand because... Uh, any lens can then have added tricks up its sleeve. 
And the fun thing about that too is if you do you know, get bit by the macro bug and you want to play around with more macro photography, you can take these extension tubes and add them onto a macro lens if you decide to buy them afterwards. And now you get more than the one-to-one -one life size. You can get closer and see more details in the world around you. So extension tubes are a nice thing to have. Cool. And they weigh nothing. So if you're into, say, travel photography, oh, yeah. throw those in, there, in your bag with whatever else you have and it, it doesn't add any weight to your, to your luggage. Or very little, and very little space as well. I mean, this is about the size of maybe a 50 millimeter lens or one of those really small prime lenses. So uh, you, you will have to have some space to physically fit it somewhere, um, but stick it in your coat pocket if you're going on an airplane and, and nobody's any the wiser. Cool. Um, what else was I going to ask you? So the, the process with the snowflakes, is there any way to kind of show us, like you showed us a before and an after, maybe just a quick walkthrough um, without showing us every single step? Of course, of course. Well, I was going to show you uh, with another refraction photograph just to start off with. And I'll show you, uh, I'll do a quick little screen share here of, uh, of Lightroom. And in Lightroom here, I've got a photograph of a uh, flower petal with some water droplets on it. And if I zoom in on that, you can see that I have a very, very small amount that's in focus within some of these droplets. Uh, what's in focus in one droplet is now out of focus in the other, where uh, the bottom droplet has its outer edge in focus, but the center is out of focus. The one above it has the center in focus, but the outer edge out of focus. So it just goes to show you how shallow that depth of field can be. Now, if you can see on the film strip on the bottom, I've taken a lot of photographs of this exact same thing, and this is all handheld. So, um, what I would do is I would just move, and I'd sway ever so slightly, keeping in mind that my depth of field is probably half a millimeter or so, and I'd move slowly as my camera is in burst mode, and I'd just take as many shots as I humanly can do without moving very far out of the frame. And uh, if I click on the next one, you can see that that one's uh, a little bit focused further in one direction, further even in that direction. And if I go back the other way, you can see that it's starting to go um, in a forward direction and I have the focus coming further and further forward and further forward even still. So I can take these images and I can combine them together in Photoshop. And, uh, and that process is actually pretty easy to do. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to select a few of these. Uh, let's say five would be enough at least just to experiment with. And what I'll do is I will edit, open as layers in Photoshop. And this will open up Photoshop automatically and throw all of these images in their own, um, uh, in the same document, but all as separate layers. And that's exactly where we would need to go to, um, uh, to continue on with that process. Now it's going to take a minute for it to, to load up five images into Photoshop. Uh, and when that finishes, I'll show you how to continue on next. But the, the process for the snowflakes typically involves between 20 and 30 separate images, sometimes as many as 50. 50 is the most that I've done. And, uh, and that would allow me to have every tip from the, the foremost tip to the, uh, the tip in the, in the background in focus and allow me to make some nice big framed artwork out of those because the resolution is high enough and it's nice and crisp and sharp. Pretty cool. Now, what version of Photoshop was did this start in? You have CS6? I have CS6, and I was using it prior in CS5 as well. It may work in CS4, but uh, I haven't been using this technique uh, that that long ago, so I'm not sure if it's if it's in there. I'll show you where the option is, and if you're a CS4 user, you can always take a look and see if it's there for you. Um, but uh, for now, we'll be looking at CS6 and how the pro which is identical to CS5 as well. So the software yep. works the same. I way. know I know that some of my students and and readers also use Elements. Is that something that Elements can do, or they Elements they... cannot do this. Oh. This is one of the things that uh, it's it's one of the benefits that Photoshop gives you if you're a uh, full on um, a full version user. Gotcha. So now I'm going to uh, do a screen share again here. And let's pull up. There we go. So this is showing my workspace in, uh, in Photoshop CS6. And you can see that I've got the five images set up here. Now I've got a problem in that they're not aligned properly. If I click on the little uh, eyes to, to hide them, some of them might be close, but some of them are quite a bit off. Uh, from the other. So I have to align these all first of all. That's step number one. So if I collect, uh, click on these five images, make sure that they're all selected. 
And then if I go Edit, Auto Align Layers. And in here, I don't really need to play with anything. I'm just going to let Photoshop work its magic and click OK. And it's going to try and align these images as if I was on a tripod using focusing rails and all of that stuff, which is another technique that you can use to, uh, to get these lined up properly. And some people do, uh, but I just find it a bit too time consuming. So now you can see that they're aligned. And Photoshop usually does a really good job at aligning them. And it pretty much made them perfect. So that's all well and good. Now, the next process is going to be to blend the in-focus areas of these images together. Photoshop has an automated process for this, but it doesn't work as well as it should. Uh, it's one of the areas I, I hope that they improve upon in future versions, but I'll show you my workaround to this. If I take all of these images and I right-click and I go duplicate layers, so I'm creating two sets of my images to start with. I'm going to blend one set, and then I'm going to use the original set that's already aligned to paint back in, using layer masks, areas where Photoshop goofed up. So the, the real magic here happens when I go Edit, and I choose Auto Blend Layers. And Auto Align and Auto Blend, this is how you can manually put a panorama together. But This is also where you have the option to stack images, as far as focus stacking is concerned and Photoshop automatically recognizes that they are overlapped by a very strong degree and automatically selects stack images for me. And I just click OK. So there and isn't a wait. specific setting in Photoshop that says photo stacking, it's auto blend that you're looking for. Yes, uh, and, and the stack images option is hidden within that particular setting. Um, and there's no option to automate this process from beginning to end through Lightroom or any other process. You've got to go and do them uh, independently. And, and thankfully so, because I can now duplicate the layers and, and my whole workflow is possible within Photoshop. Now, I should also mention there are other... Uh, what was that? Sorry, darling? Could you do it with an action? Or is that what you're saying you cannot do? Uh, you, you probably could do that with an action. However, sometimes it doesn't align them properly, and I always go through and I make sure that they're aligned properly as part of the process. If they are not, I'll nudge them back into place using a difference blending mode to see how closely they overlap. And, um, and thankfully, they, they worked fine here in this case. Um, I was going to mention that there are other programs that do this, but Photoshop gives me the full control that I'm going to show you here in order to fix mistakes and, and make it all work together. So... If you saw that, it just popped into focus. Everything that was not in focus, I'll, uh, I'll zoom in and, and uh, revert back here. So I'm just going to bring this up full screen, as, as full as I can here. And that's before, and that's after. That's amazing. So Photoshop does a really good job at throwing these together, but it's not perfect. Um, you can see in some cases, if I zoom in and I look up over here, near where the edges of the frames were, it, it had some sort of artifacting problem um, that was creating a, a bit of a, a, an issue here right where the frames blended together or where the edges of the frames hit, uh, hit other edges. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my layers over here on this side. I'm just going to make the window a bit smaller again so we can see all the, the layer work. Um, and I'm going to merge them together, which is just Control-E or Command-E on the keyboard, and drag that to the bottom of the stack. And then hide all of the other images. Now what I can do is I can click on, let's try and find the layer that's the background layer here that's showing my, my big in focus area. Let's try and find which layer that is. And it, it's actually this one right here. So what I can do is I can take this layer, create a layer mask with it, and invert the layer mask so that it's completely hiding that particular image. And I can paint it back in over top of the areas where Photoshop goofed up. Oh, very cool. So you're not doing cloning on cloning on cloning. No, it, not, not in this case. Now, I probably will have to clone to make these edges here line up properly because it's now got a bit of a glowing edge because my framing was a bit off from one to the next. Um, but if I also move over to, say, down here, in this particular droplet, I've got some issues where I can probably fix this with cloning because uh, it's got some weird blooming artifacts that are showing up. Um, is that in this layer? No, nope, it's in another layer. So let's turn on this one and see. Yeah, that actually looks pretty good in there. Let's see the one above it. I actually like that one even better. So 
Let's turn that on and create a layer mask and invert it and then paint on from this one particular layer a fix for the weird blooming artifact that was there. So I would continue to go through the entire image um, making these changes and adjustments. It can be fixed in a lot of ways by using cloning and, and that kind of stuff, but it's easier to use the image's original source uh, to get it the best that it can be before I start to clone. Uh, but the process will eventually end in me cloning out things, especially with snowflakes, like the little fibers from the mitten in the background, and that all has to be done by hand. So, so I'll show you some more examples of that too. These, but you mentioned that you're shooting these handheld. Is there a particular reason? Like, do you find the tripod more cumbersome? Because you can get these particular heads for macro that have these little things that slide your camera forward a millimeter at a time, right? Yes, f focusing rails. And that is helpful if you are in a very controlled environment where your subject is not moving and will never move. Um, and I rarely shoot in that type of scenario. The, the photograph that I just showed you may have worked with that, um, but it worked just as fine without it. And my workflow has sort of developed around snowflake photography, and then I apply it to other subjects as well. And the reason why I can't do that with snowflakes is because if I am out in the freezing cold and I have a snowflake that has just fallen on my mitten, I have very little time to get in the exact proper angle. And sometimes I even nudge the snowflake around into a better angle with a paintbrush just to get it on just the right uh, degree for the flash to reflect on it. Um, the snowflake will either melt or it'll blow away or it will get smothered by other falling snowflakes if I don't work fast enough. And in order to get a tripod aligned in just such a way, typically you move, uh, it, in setups with focusing rails, you'll move your subject into the proper alignment. But I have to move the camera into proper alignment, and I have to do it quickly. So, yeah, add no tripods. It's all handheld. Okay. But that introduces a bit of a problem, too. Because in a lot of these images, if my, uh, if my camera is not 100% aligned from, uh, from one shot to the next, then when I'm trying to put together a snowflake such as this that has some pretty long branches you know, uh, across uh, these diagonals, then these lines will not be straight. They'll, well, they'll be straight, but they'll ever so slightly deviate from their, uh, their exact angle. So they won't line up properly. And I have to go in and manually, almost like an art form, realign them in Photoshop by masking in pieces from other images uh, to make it look like they're 100% perfectly straight. But in, in reality, this, this line going from the top of the snowflake all the way down through to the bottom is not 100% straight. Um, it'll break at different points, and I just hide it with different defects in the snowflake, like right in uh, the middle areas here. Uh, I can m sort of fudge things a bit in order to... Uh, to, to make it work. I've noticed in some of your snowflakes, do you have one that has that sort of rainbow, almost prism looking effect? I do, I do. Now you'll notice that in a lot of snowflakes. In fact, in this one it does show up a little bit around some of the contours. Um, but I'm, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what phenomenon creates that. If it's something I'm doing or if it's something in the snow crystal itself that uh, I can't really predict or uh, or control in any way. But I will show you, uh, I'll find a good one. I know that I have at least two really good ones uh, from last season, although I haven't found many from this season just yet. Um, now you're working on a project right now involving snowflakes, right? I am, yes. Yeah. So the project that I'm working on right now is called Snowflake a Day, and it's where I edit one snowflake photograph every single day for 100 days starting December 1st yes. and, and post it on Google+. And that's right now pretty much the only, only place where you can find them. So if you want to see a lot of the, the recent work of mine with snowflakes, you can check it out there. Um, in a photograph of a snowflake, there's often all sorts of mysteries that will come up. And sometimes it happens to be this prismatic color. And this is the most bizarre example of it that I've, uh, that I've encountered so far. You can see in this particular snowflake, um, there is color in a ring around the center uh, hexagon of the snow crystal. And that is created by a prismatic effect, and it's something that is 100% completely natural. 
I've increased the saturation slightly uh, in this particular example, but I didn't add in any false color there. That's 100% the snowflake as it is. And that's kind of fun to see when I can see a snow crystal doing all sorts of bizarre, strange things such as that. It, uh, it just you know, brings me back to the childhood curiosity of yeah. finding a snowflake on my mitten when well, I was four years old. So I I'll was find a, another example here too. Bit, uh, I was a little bit taken aback when you said 100 days because, I mean, number one, that's a long project to do and that sounds like a lot of work every day. About two to four hours every day. I'm a little freaked out by the fact that we have 100 days of, of snow a year. <laughs> Well, we don't. Uh, see, a lot of the photographs that I'm editing right now were taken at the end of November because uh -huh. we haven't had a whole lot of snow lately. So I don't get snow every day, but I can photograph snowflakes and sort of store them in, uh, in an archive until every day I go back to a good day and I'll start editing them. Uh, so I post one a day, but I don't photograph one a day. I do the editing typically about once a day. Okay, so two to four hours. I was going to ask you that, like how long from start to finish on one well, in some cases, it's been as many as six hours for, uh, for some of the really, really big ones that actually involve grid panorama stitching, uh, which is another thing altogether. But in, in the case of this one here, you've got the prismatic colors that you were talking about uh, mm -hmm. in this particular image. And there's a lot of color that will come up in, uh, in some of these snowflakes to the point where it's almost like there's little trapped rainbows inside them. Mm-hmm. And I just find that's a fascinating thing to, uh, to be able to capture. And it's interesting that you don't see that when you're taking the picture. Uh, you only see that when you look at the back of the camera. It's almost invisible when, when you're looking through the viewfinder. So it's a wonderful surprise when you see it. Well, and I don't think we think of ice as having color unless it's, you know, lit up with Christmas lights. Well, that's true. Uh, however, ice is actually, and this is going to get somewhat sciencey for just a, a brief moment. Is okay, that, you, can, you can geek out a little bit. Okay. Um, ice is one of the uh, things, uh, as well as calcite and plastics and, and a few other things, um, that, have, uh, that are affected by something called biofringence. And biofringence, uh, well, I'll save it from getting too technical, but if you have a... Uh, polarizer in front of your flash and then you have one in front of your camera. So polarizer in front of the flash is going this way, in front of the camera is going this way. You should see absolutely no light come in from the flash into your camera because it's canceling itself out. Right. However, if you put ice in front of that, then you will see a psychedelic rainbow effect happen. Uh, and the same is true if you take like a, a cheap CD case and you put it in between, you'll see a psychedelic rainbow effect happen. And this is an interesting idea. It's not uh, you know, prism split in color. It's the way that the light bends through the ice and messes up with the polarization to create a rainbow effect. And this is something that I haven't had the chance to experiment with yet, but I have uh, polarizing filters for the camera, uh, linear filters, and linear filters for both of my flashes. And I plan on experimenting with this in the very near future when the weather gets cold enough for me to have snowflakes on microscope slides. And I've seen people do this to frost, and it looks really cool with frost, uh, but I haven't seen anybody attempt this with snowflakes yet. So um, I hope that if I'm not the first, then uh, I'll be one of the first, and it'll be just a fun experiment to make some fun, funky rainbow snowflakes. Hmm, I'll have to keep an eye out for that. Yeah, I'm hoping to put that in part of the series this year. Now, you have another image that um, was kind of one of the favorites of mine when I looked through your portfolio when I came across your work. Um, I think I originally saw you on Google Plus in a Hangout or something, and um, you had this really cool image of a Canadian flag. Can yes. Talk about that. That is my favorite photograph to date, and uh, this particular image is uh, is about four months in the making. I'm just going to pull it up here. Um, this is a selection of red maple leaves on a bed of snow. And this was actually the photograph that launched my career. Uh, after I took this photograph on January 11th, 2009, uh, that's when I started to think that I can, I can go pro with this because of the feedback that I got from it. But you don't have red maple leaves in the middle of winter time. So it's a very difficult photograph to take. And um, I had to go and, uh, and, and take the leaves in the fall and think, okay, well, how do I preserve them? And let's think back to kindergarten. The only thing that I remember from kindergarten is ironing leaves between wax paper preserves them. 
So get out the wax paper, start ironing leaves. My parents think I'm crazy at this point because I was still living at home at the time. And they're like, okay, you need the iron to iron leaves and wax paper for what? You're how old? And um, so about four months later in the, uh, in the dead of winter, I had to wait for a winter day uh, with fresh snow that has just fallen, uh, bright sunshine, and absolutely no wind. And finally that day came, I was looking, I was turning into a meteorologist trying to figure out when those conditions would align and uh, just laid out the leaves and the shop made itself. Very cool. Now you also used that same print in a water droplet. For I DVD. did. You're, yeah. you're stealing my thunder here. I was just I I was preparing to bring that up. <laughs> and so one of the interesting things about water droplet refraction photography is that you can put anything behind a water droplet and it gets refracted into the water droplet. So in this case, I made a print of my maple leaf flag image and I put it behind these droplets that are suspended in a spider web. And this is focus stacked as well. I forget how many frames I, I used in putting this one together. But I just took a little mist bottle to a very dense erratic spider web and then stuck the image behind it and snapped away. And that was the results. And uh, in this case, I could have either flipped the images upside down afterwards or put the image behind it upside down to begin with. And, and I did the latter. I put it upside down to begin with. And, um, and that's kind of a fun little way to experiment with macro photography. Take a photograph that you love and try to see what it does inside of a water droplet and have some fun with it. That is very, very cool. Thank you. Very, very cool. Um, so do you have anything else that you're you're working on? I know you had some adventures recently. Um, well, one thing, and, and thank you for bringing that up too. I had almost forgotten. Um, one thing that I, I did want to mention, and when I was starting to read about photography and get more interested in photography, I found a book at a used bookstore uh, called National Geographic, The Photographs. Really big book, nice hardcover. Um, picked it up for pennies, really. And I was reading through that book. And, and somewhere in that book, um, they, this book chronicles the entire inception of photography with National Geographic until the point when it was published in about the mid-90s. And they, I guess they had asked one of their photographers at some point in this book, how do you take such great pictures? Like, wh what, what's your secret? C can you give me any tips? And the guy just shrugged and said, F8 and be there. <laughs> and and that really stuck with me because it just abstracts every setting on the camera. It abstracts everything that you could, any button or setting or film that you could buy at the time. None of that mattered. It What mattered was being there. And uh, because of that, I've gone on a few adventures in the last little while. Um, one of them this, uh, this year was to Bulgaria. And that's my fiance's home country. And it's our second time there. We go every other year, I think. And I decided, you know what? We're in a very interesting part of the world. Let's look up something interesting to photograph here. So I located a, an abandoned Soviet-era monument slash meeting place high in the mountains that some other urban exploration photographers had come across, and they'd taken some pictures inside. And they weren't the greatest pictures, but I saw that the location had the greatest potential. So we went up to this particular monument on like a dozen hairpin turns up a mountain with a car we rented that barely worked. And uh, thankfully they drive on the same side of the road as us, so that wasn't, uh, that wasn't a huge challenge. But I, we ended up getting to this monument and breaking inside through a tiny little hole in the wall, uh, we were able to find one of the most beautiful uh, examples of a dereliction and just you know urban decay that I've ever seen. And uh, and this is th one of the shots that was taken from inside of this monument. Wow. How big is that place? Not as big as the photograph makes it look. This is taken with a fisheye lens. Um, it would probably take me about 30 seconds to walk from one side to the other. Um, like it hockey, was, hockey arena size, football stadium size? Uh, let's say, yeah, maybe a, a slightly smaller than a hockey arena. Okay. As far as the, the ice area and then just pretend that the ice from the corners is, uh, is circular. And in this particular shot, um, it was quite nerve-wracking because the roof was pretty much stolen. It was originally made of copper and was quite beautiful when it was uh, originally made in the early 1980s. Uh, but then when it was abandoned, looters came in and store any stole anything of value, including most of the roof. So there's just sheet metal on the roof, and it's on the top of a mountain that gets quite windy. So when the wind picks up, um, the entire roof rattles like it's about to collapse. 
So it was a little bit scary to, to be inside of this particular monument. Um, but uh, I'm just going to try to find another picture of this. Uh, and there's the, the center of the... Uh, uh, I think that says Proletarians of the World Unite in, uh, mm -hmm. in Old Bulgarian. But it was quite a beautiful, um, and this is a panorama that I had produced. We spent a bit of time inside, uh, but also a bit of time outside as well. And this is what it looks like from the outside. Very beautiful countryside, but the building itself looks like a UFO. And I just had to add this on to the end of our trip. This was on the last day that we were going to be in the country. To, uh, to just, you know what, we've got the time, let's not relax, let's go on an adventure, let's find something worth photographing, let's go somewhere that we wouldn't otherwise go. And it turned out to be a wonderful experience. Um, F8 and B there really sort of guided me to, uh, inspired me and motivated me to, to go out there and take these pictures, and I'm very happy that it did. So to that same end, uh, I recently spent about three weeks in the Yukon in September. And that allowed me to photograph some of the best images of my career so far, including a few that I'm very, uh, very fond of that, uh, that are actually up in my office. And I'll share two of them with you. This one here is taken from the top of a mountain. Uh, and I hiked up this mountain with very sore knees and a very heavy backpack to, uh, to photograph a, a, an HDR at sunset and then scramble down uh, before the sun completely disappeared and we were stranded in the middle of nowhere. So uh, this is, uh, if you can see the White Mountains in the background, that's the border uh, between the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. So this is um, pretty far north and bordering the two territories. It was a beautiful place to be and the only reason why I hiked up this mountain instead of being satisfied halfway, uh, halfway up and looking back was because I needed to be there. I needed to be at the top of that mountain in order to take the best shot that I could. And I only had one chance at it. So I, I pushed myself probably far, uh, harder than I should have, but uh, it generally it generally worked well. And, uh, and one further image that I'll show off here is, uh, I'm going to say is my favorite so far from that trip. I haven't edit, edited them all yet. Uh, I've been a little bit uh, delayed in getting that done. Um, but this particular image I call Eye of the Solar Storm. And oh, wow. this is a seven frame composite of the northern lights with a fisheye lens that bring in a bit of a star trail with the northern lights cascading everywhere except for in the eye of the, uh, uh, the spinning stars. Now, I played around with this. And I, I experimented and I tried to do this image with all of the frames that I had captured, and it didn't work out so well. Uh, so I went and I just chose seven. But I chose them in a special sequence. Um, if you can sort of take a look at some of the, uh, the stars as they're moving around in here, you can see that these stars start closer together and get farther and farther and farther apart. This is all the same star, just from different frames. And I modeled it on a Fibonacci sequence so that, um, that it would have that sort of uh, acceleration effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I adjusted it to choose the images that were the most pleasing in the set. But I think that that was one of the best moments to just be out there in the middle of the night, in the middle of the Yukon, uh, traveling with a bunch of hunters. There's no reason why I would ever be there if I was not a photographer looking for great pictures. And I think that my life experiences are better because of it. So photography helps me explore the world, uh, not only on a macro scale, but to explore even this great country of ours. Very cool. And the world. And the world. Yeah, I know personally I've had lots of, of adventures and misadventures and, you know, all kinds of things. Now, your fiancé, is she into photography or no, or no? She's an artist, but she's a painter. And she's not that much into photography, but she does a lot of wonderful abstract paintings, and I'm often inspired by the work that she does as well. So what does she feel like when you're going into this, you know, spaceship-looking thing in Bulgaria? Is she oh, she was right behind me. She, she, she was right there, yep. <laughs> So I know I know that's a concern for a lot of people that have a spouse or a significant other that that isn't into photography. They're like, well, come on, you know, they're they're doing this all the time. Can you hurry up and take the photo? Let's go, let's go. So well, I, I'll say that most of the times when I'm taking pictures, uh, like if I'm doing snowflakes, she's not standing beside me in minus twenty degree weather in the complete <laughs> darkness. Uh, she's inside, warm, probably watching TV or something. And uh, I, as she should be, I wouldn't want anybody out there with me. 
Um, so it all depends on what I'm doing and where I'm going. But uh, for that type of thing, it was not just a uh, photo trip. It was just a general adventure. Mm -hmm. And if I can throw pictures into that, then it's great for both of us. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I try and advise people, you know, incorporate something that you can both be interested in because for my husband and I, when we travel, we've worked out a system. You know, he likes to... Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. He likes to go to like a local pub or something, and go and have a beer and chat with some of the locals. And so he'll do that. your situation a little bit. But yeah. if you can make everybody happy, then by all means, that's the way you yeah. do it. Doesn't work exactly. So, is there anything else that you would like to share? Um, I know your websites are down the bottom there, and I'll I'll put them on the uh, on the on the website for people so that they can find your work. Um, do you have prints available if people are interested to see more? Absolutely. Of uh, every, every one of my images is available in print form. Uh, I, I saw quite a few of the Maple Leaf flag, um, especially this time of the year, actually. I've sold a few as Christmas gifts. So if anybody's interested in my artwork and wants to put some on the wall, by all means, I'll, I'll make it for you. Um, I also teach a lot of workshops, uh, not only through Georgian College here in Barrie, but uh, I've just signed up to do one at the Brooks Institute of Photography in California. Oh wow! And that's going to be a macro photography workshop, and so I, I, I give all my secrets. And in fact, one of the things that I do is I preserve snowflakes, and it's with a very special scientific resin that I can preserve them and take them indoors. And so when I teach my macro photography workshops, I bring snowflakes into the classroom so that my students can photograph them and, and try their hand at it. So it's always a fun time. And, uh, and so I, I do a lot of workshops. Uh, I offer printing services too, so if you have your own images that you want to have printed, just let me know and, uh, and I can work that out. So, And you know what, if you have any questions, if anybody just says, oh, we can, can I learn more about that? I spend a lot of time answering emails and I love to do that as well, so just get and, in touch. And they can find you on Google+. Plus. Um, yes, check uh, me out. On, that's where I'm most active online on Google+. Uh, so just find me there. The, I don't know if you can put a link uh, to my, uh, my stream on that as well. And then my website, doncom.ca, is where you can find much of the rest of my stuff. That's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing all that, Don. It's been eye-opening, and I've learned a couple of things that uh, I'm eager to try out, and um, maybe I'll come take one of your workshops and try my hand at preserved snowflakes. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Okay. Thanks very much for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Take care and have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too.